Father, as we've sung that, we invite your Holy Spirit to breathe on us, uh, to pour your Spirit out now. Holy Spirit, come upon us. Lord, that we would receive what you would have for us, uh, that you would renew re re and transform us more in your likeness and more in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. In um, John chapter 6, we come across um, Jesus in the account of the loaves and the fishes. Now, this story is found in all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, so we can safely consider that this was something everyone thought was a significant event in Jesus' life. And it all begins with um, Jesus out there um, conducting an outdoor event out in the Wops um, by the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and at this time, the place was chocker. Um, about 5,000 men there, and there would have been women and children as well. Kind of like a Woodstock type event, if you like. Um, uh, oh wait, I'll leave it there. Um, <laughs> there. There were those who'd um, come to hear what Jesus had to say about the kingdom of God. Uh, there were those who came who were desperately looking for a miracle or of one kind or another, uh, for a healing or a word of prophetic insight. And then there would have been those who came just to simply to see the circus, uh, possibly so that they, when they returned home they'd have something really cool to talk about at the table. <coughs> Now, now, at this stage of his ministry, Jesus was drawing crowds wherever he went. Uh, even out here in the outback, everyone had walked for days and days to see what he was all about, which probably might sound a bit extreme for us. I mean, I know people who will complain about taking a 40-minute drive from Auckland to Walkworth. But from what we understand um, from John and Destiny in, in South Sudan and their experiences, if people are desperate, they will find a way. They will walk. Um, even if it means two or three days walking with the kids in tow, they will come. Um, and this is what it was like um, at, at, at this time. Um, as people gathered for this event, Jesus taught them about the kingdom of God and he, was, he, had, the, he had the stuff people wanted to hear. Um, but round about the end of the day, as the, as the time was coming to an end and, and Jesus had healed the last people who needed to be healed, it was late afternoon um, and it would be dark soon. So the apostles approached Jesus and they say, said to him, Lord, you've got to send these guys away to find something to eat from the local villages and farms because it's going to be a long walk home for them, for a lot of them anyway. And to which, of course, Jesus replies, do you remember what he says? Why don't you feed them yourselves? <laughs> to which Philip answers, well, simple mathematics, Jesus. <laughs> 5,000 people plus women and children, let's say 10 to 12,000 people, you know, when you crunch the numbers, we're kind of be, going to be looking at half a day's wages just for every person to have one bite of bread. Now, that's why we're not feeding them ourselves, Jesus. You kind of sense a little bit of frustration in Philip's response. But then Andrew pop, pops up and he says, well, that's not completely true. He says, we do have a kid here and he's offered his lunch, five small loaves of bread and a couple of fish. It might be a bit of a stretch, but what do you think, Jesus? And Jesus tells the disciples to go and sit the crowd down. And he goes over to the boy and he takes what he has to offer and he, and he blesses it before God. And then Jesus just starts handing out the food. First to his apostles, a fish there, a loaf there, a loaf there, a fish here. And it just keeps on going and going and going. And, and to the point where when they pick up the scraps, it says there are 12 baskets left over full to the brim. And this is kind of one of those miracles you just can't really explain away, can you? Um, it was, um, you couldn't put it down to the power of positive thinking. This was a top, for the people of Israel at that time, the people who were there gathered, this was a top tier miracle, if you like. This was like Elisha with that jar of oil that just kept pouring oil, if you remember that story. Or Moses out in the desert and every morning there's, for 40 years there's manna on the ground that people can eat. Um, this, this, in the eyes of the Jewish people, this would have automatically elevated Jesus to top tier, top, top tier prophet status, along with Moses, Elijah and Elisha. And yet, as amazing as the story is, um, there's one piece that's very central to this that I'm not sure we always reflect on. And that is, what about the child? What about the child who had the bread and the fish? Um, what if he decided to himself, no, they can feed themselves. <laughs> I'm hungry. And they can sort out their own problems. Or if, what if the child thought, well, you know, what I've got here, it's, it's not really good enough to feed myself, let alone anyone else. No, I don't really have that much to offer. 
And is the boy that crucial to this story? You know, would have it made a difference anyway? Would have Jesus been completely stumped if the boy wasn't present? I suspect not. You know, surely you would have thought that Jesus could have figured another way to feed people without the little boy's lunch. And then when you think about that a little bit more, why would Jesus need the, the boy in the first place? Why would he need us? Surely it would be a lot easier for him to do stuff himself, wouldn't it? Without anybody's help? I mean, he is God after all. But what if there's another reason why Jesus chooses to use people than simply because it's, he needs us? What if Jesus' plan to use us is for our benefit and not his? What if Jesus wants us to grow? To be confident in being the people he's called us to be? What if Jesus wants us to grow in faith? That he's with us, whatever the situation we might find ourselves in. What if Jesus wants us to grow in the spirit and wisdom and maturity? And to spend a life walking with him. So we instinctively know when the Holy Spirit's leading us. See, if we go to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, this is um, how the Apostle Paul tells us we should respond to God. He says, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Don't conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you, then you will be able to test and approve what the God's will is. What the Apostle Paul is saying here is that as we will, God will grow us as we make a practice of offering ourselves to him. Isn't that interesting? Service leads to growth. But what does offering ourselves mean? Does it mean singing worship on a Sunday morning? Or does it mean selling all our worldly goods to give to the poor? Or, or travelling to Africa to become a missionary? Well, perhaps that might be what God's calling you to do. But if we carry on through this, um, through onto the next series of verses in this passage of Romans that the Apostle Paul's talking about, the Apostle Paul says, offering ourselves starts with recognizing what we have to offer. If we go on to chapter 12, uh, verse 3, it says, Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. In other words, he says, Think practically, honestly, and sensibly. That's what sober judgment means. What do I have to offer? What has God given me that I can use? A bit like the boy with the fish. And then in verse 6, he goes on to say, You all have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, then do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. Interesting here, Paul speaks about a lot of different gifts, doesn't he? And, the, and there's a word that um, Paul uses in this passage in, in Greek uh, for gifts. Does anyone know what that word is? Yes, you do. It's up there. It's charisma. Okay. Uh, and the charisma... <coughs> It describes the different individual spiritual abilities that God has given us. Um, and we see a wide range of them expressed here. Um, from prophecy to service, from leadership to encouragement, to giving, to having mercy. Now this isn't the only place in the New Testament um, that charisma gifts are discussed. Um, for example, in 1 Corinthians 12, we're told there are different types of gifts. Same word, charisma. But the Spirit distributes them. And in this passage, it goes on to list some, some gifts, some that we've spoken about, some that are different. Uh, healing, prophecy, wisdom, discernment, and speaking in tongues. Further on, in um, 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, Each one of you should use whatever gift, whatever charisma you have received to serve the others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And it lists serving or teaching or prophecy, depends which version you're reading, um, is specifically. But in each of these passages, that same word for gift, charisma, is given. And each time, charisma means certain God-given uh, abilities or strengths or, or, or things that people have tendencies towards. Now, when I was a bit younger and learning about gifts in church, I was taught that there, was some, there were differences between the types of gifts that were, that were here. Some were spiritual, like the ones in 1 Corinthians 12, and, and some were more practical, like the ones in Romans. 
Um, there was, I'd heard them being divided into ministry gifts and motivational gifts and manifestation gifts. And, and not there's, there's necessarily anything wrong with categorizing the gifts in these ways, but the thing is, that's not exactly what the Bible says. The Bible says that each one of these gifts are manifestations of God's Spirit at work within us. Each one of these gifts are charisma. That means whether it's a practical gift or a supernatural gift, it is bestowed upon people by the Spirit of God. Now you might want to ask, well, why do people need to make distinctions? I, th- I kind of think that's part of the way we do things with a Western mindset compared to a Jewish mindset. See, in a Western mindset, which all, pretty much all of us, I would imagine, have grown up in, um, we often like to categorize things, particularly when it comes to spiritual and practical. Whereas the Jewish mindset seems to be a lot more holistic. The Jewish mindset seems to recognize that everything kind of comes from God, whether it doesn't matter how it manifests itself. I mean, you could say one example of this is an artistic talent. If you go back into Exodus um, chapter 31, uh, verses 1 to 5, um, God speaks about the, the gift of art. He says, See, I've chosen Bezaliel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, son of the tribe of Judah, and I've filled him with the Spirit of God, and I've filled him with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, and all kinds of skills to make artistic designs. Now, some of you might think, well, art and craft is not necessarily a supernatural thing. Either you have it or you don't. But what this passage is, is saying is that artistic skills, that the artistic skills that Bezaliel possessed, they were actually gifted to him by the Holy Spirit. So any arty people? Isn't that kind of good news? Ooh. See, our gifts and abilities come to us from God. And, and that's not to say that any gift that God gives us still doesn't need to be honed and developed. Um, often this happens as we mature and we use what we have, uh, whether that be prophecy or teaching or giving or whatever it is. But what this is saying is every ability that we have finds its source in God. So whether you've got a natural ability with accounting or communicating, or the arts, or praying for people to be healed, or raising people from the dead. In the Jewish way of thinking, these are all gifts that have been distributed from the Holy Spirit for the building up of his church. Now, having talked about charisma and what they are, you might want to ask, well, why is this subject, what's, what's so significant about the subject? Why is this a challenging subject for us? There's a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, I think this subject can be challenging because the Bible says we're given gifts or charismas not for ourselves but for the body of Christ. Uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. In other words, for everybody. Um, whether it be art, leadership, or compassion for others. In Romans 12, 5, it says, In Christ we, though many, form one body. And, we can, um, and each member belongs to the others. And how do you feel like, how about that, belonging to the other, everyone else? <laughs> Depends how much you got, I guess. <laughs> so, but what it's saying here is our differences are somehow to combine and contribute towards each other. We need each other to function optimally. This is what it's saying. Uh, and the first thing I thought of that, that jumped into my mind when I thought about this was a toy that I used to um, see on TV as a kid. It was all the rage and it was Voltron. Defender of the universe. Um, and Voltron was basically five distinct lions that you had to buy, of course, individually. Um, I think we got a picture there. Ah, oh. uh, there we go. You had to, each one. But of course, you needed all five because when you, when you, once you got all five, then you could put them together and create that. I mean, it is kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you had this giant robot with the big sword. I think the big sword was an option. It came extra as well. So, but here's the thing, one or two lions wasn't enough to create Voltron Defender of the Universe, you needed the whole set. This was a toy designed to suck money out of poor unsuspecting parents. And unfortunately, they weren't my parents. But as painful as that was to me at the time, I think it's quite a helpful picture of how the body of Christ, um, the Bible describes the body of Christ. Individual pieces being joined together in a way that creates something far more impressive. Every bit has its place. And just as no kid would settle for a one-armed Voltron, the body of Christ requires all its members to be engaged. Which presents us with a bit of a challenge because if God has made us to um, individually with our gifts meant to contribute to his bigger plan, do we actually know what it is we have to offer? 
Have we actually spent time trying to think that through? What is it that I've got to offer here? And if we are aware of the gifts that God has played us, placed within us, do we actually want to offer our gifts to other people? Or are we quite happy keeping them to ourselves? Now, I'm not meaning this to be a bit of a guilt trip on those who need a bit of a break from serving because we all need a rest from time to time. But over the long term, if we understand that Jesus has made all of the parts of his body to function together, it does suggest that opting out of involvement in God's family is not really an option for any of us. And that can be a bit of a challenge to us all, but partially because it means we've got a responsibility to surrender our gifts to others, but partially because it means we also have to learn to work alongside other people. And that's not always easy either. But there is one other challenge though when it comes to gifts or charismas. And that's to do with this one phrase that pops up in 12, uh, Romans 12.3. 12, in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. See, our gifts are meant to be exercised in accordance with faith. In other words, Jesus means us to use our gifts in order to grow us, to stretch us. So if we're finding ourselves getting bored in our service for Christ, we kind of probably need to ask ourselves, are we serving in accordance with faith? Or are we playing it safe? See, if we go back to that story with the young kid with the five buns and the two fishes, he could have played it safe. He could have been content using um, that food that he had to feed himself or even to feed his family, those he knew. Or he could have risked not look, looking stupid by offering this tiny little portion to Jesus when the need was so great. But instead, he decided to risk it all and offered it to Jesus because he believed offering it to Jesus was far better than keeping what he had to himself. So what is it that you have in your hand? See, I, I think just like the boy with the fish and bread, I think it's pretty safe to say Jesus doesn't need what you have. I've, sometimes I say to myself, Jesus needs me like he needs a hole in the head. Now, five, loaves and, and, uh, five loaves of bread and two fish don't go very far for uh, feeding a crowd of 5,000. But here's the thing, Jesus wants to use what you have to grow you in your faith and to glorify God through you because he wants you to be part of his story. So will you take up the challenge? So I'm not here to guilt people into service. I'm here to encourage you to accept Jesus' invitation to join him. He has given each one of us a place to play, part to play of significance in his family. But the first step for us is we need to be willing to offer up what we have, whatever that might be. And that's not a question for me to answer. This is a question for the Holy Spirit, to you and the Holy Spirit to kind of nut out between you. But the first step, as I said, is to be ready, to be willing to offer. So what do you have in your hands? So maybe this is a good time to, to start by asking him, shall we pray? Lord Jesus, you made us. You know us completely from the inside out. You know what we're capable of. You know our potential. And you made us to be part of your kingdom. So Father, on behalf of us as a congregation here, I'd ask over these next few weeks, you would make it really clear to us what it is that we have that we can offer you. And Father, for those of us who are a little bit afraid of what that might mean, I pray, I pray that we would come to realize your words, Lord. You, Jesus, you said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So with that in mind, Lord, give us confidence and boldness to trust in you. And Father, I'd like to also pray for those of um, us who might think, hey, maybe our time of service is over. Or maybe we're transitioning. Maybe we're tired or we've been disillusioned or even hurt in the past from attempts um, in, our, in our service. Lord, I would call upon your Holy Spirit for a refreshing and a re-anointing and a healing and an outpouring of joy and encouragement to flow over us this week. Lord, that our eyes would be raised to you, Jesus, and our ears would be attuned to your call on our lives again. Father, I would say bless us as we seek to bless your holy name.
And all the people said, Amen. Amen.